Calls now recording, so can you just uh, state your name? Do you prefer to be called Carol or Dr. Watson or anything like that? You can refer, you can refer to me as Carol Ann. Um, I am Dr. Carol Ann Watson, and I am a licensed clinical psychologist, and I am in private practice and have been since 1987, and I um, serve all populations. Uh, birth to death. Uh, well, first off, congratulations on the long career. Uh, could I ask uh, what got you into this field? Like, was there a specific motivation or did you just see a window of opportunity? No. Uh, actually, I started out as a special education teacher. Oh, wow. Okay. And found that a lot of people were sending um, their uh, high school students down to my classroom because they were suicidal hmm. um, and the school psychologist had not been trained in dealing with it. They were trained mainly in testing. And so that's how it started. And um, and then as I was teaching more and more, I realized that I needed to go learn more. So I went back and got my doctorate and specialized in suicide prevention. Um, and so my dissertation was on the predictors of suicide in adolescence and um, and just uh, knew that that was what I was supposed to do. I did become a principal after I was a teacher before I became a private clinical psychologist, however, because I was in the midst of all that and I finished that training. But I, I found that the students were in a line outside of my office wanting to talk to me and that's really not a principal's role so right. i needed i needed to shift gears and go private and um and but i did have a brother who also um became very suicidal when i was a freshman in or not a freshman and when i was a senior in college and i went home for the weekend and i was certain he was going to take his life and so packed him up and took him with me to college and got an apartment and uh, he lived to be 64 years old. So uh -huh. that that was also an impetus to um, learning about professional psychology. And then um, you brought up the special education specifically. I, I'm actually uh, autistic, so I definitely relate to a lot that you were talking about that you saw in other people. So I'm glad uh, that people uh, had you as that window uh, to uh, like talk about what they were going through. Like, was there like a specific standout within special ed that you wanted to help out, or I, I actually, I actually am a specialist in autism oh. and, as one of my specialties. But um, we, um, my husband and I, both were specialists in autism, and we spent a large part of our career with autistic children and adolescents and adults. And I continue to work with autism. Uh, I have presently two small children um, that are pre preschool before um, they're not in school yet, mm -hmm. preschool, and um, and I have one. Um, adult, autistic, and um, he actually just published a book, and he named me as one of the authors, but I I really just edited for him. I didn't author the book, but he's on Amazon, and he doesn't mind if I tell people, but I can do that at a, a later time. I can let Sherry know um, the name of that book. You may be interested, especially because you're autistic, mm -hmm. in getting that book. Yeah, I'd love to check it out, and I'm sure that uh, the other students, uh, if you're able to get it to her in a good time, uh, would love to check it out, too. Uh, do you feel like this, like the stigma against autism has changed over the years? Do you feel like it stayed the same, or like how do you feel like that has changed? Well, I think, unfortunately, the stigmas really don't change. They just mm -hmm. change the name. Um, you know, they, they changed mental retardation um, to developmentally delayed. They, they, change, um, um, they change names and terms, but the stigma remains. People are ignorant. People mm -hmm. don't learn, and, and they don't want to learn uh, lots of times. And so the stigma remains. That's why we have to educate people um, in many forums to try and teach people that many of us are just um, 
we are challenged differently mm -hmm. and we are not different we are human beings and we are the same but we're challenged differently and we face problems differently but that doesn't make us different but yes i think um i don't think I personally don't think it's gotten much better, but then I work with it all the time. So I see the, the bad things that happen to people that are autistic. And I um, continue to try to educate people. The funding is better. There's more mm -hmm. funding now for uh, programs for autistic children. But I don't think that that's improved for autistic adults. But you could speak to that more than me. Mm hmm yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely agree with a, a lot that you're saying. I do feel like the stigma against it has lightened with newer generations, I think, are being more uh, welcoming, I guess, to those uh, situations. But I yes, do, I, agree. I think I agree. that it is still easier to get into a negative mentality about these things than to kind of open that third eye and to see the other side of it, if that makes sense. That's right. That's right. I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. And then, like, do you feel like that, like, that situation of, like, it's easier to be in that negative mentality, do you feel like that's a boundary when it comes to getting into uh, the field that you're in? Like, is, like, how do you maintain boundaries with clients while still being, like, empathetic and supportive, I guess, is what I would ask. I think one of the biggest things I do is I really promote that we have to have our boundaries. We have to have balance in our life and we have to have our boundaries. And the biggest mistake that therapists make is they cross the boundaries and they, um, they don't know their own boundaries before they start their practice. They need to know their own boundaries long before they actually graduate. And so I work, I, we have an academy, it's called America's Academy of Coaching, Counseling and Hypnotherapy. And we closed it down, uh, we're opening it back up in January. But um, it, that's one of the main things I teach um, is ethics and boundaries because that's the biggest mistakes that therapists make. Um, it, for example, I am very, very private. Mm -hmm. I don't bring people into my home. Recently, I opened a home office, so that changes it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I don't meet everyone in my home office. I have another office I use, and it's only certain people that I can bring to my home. But I, I recommend that people have their private life and their work life. And I recommend that they balance themselves so they're not just working. Because at one point, I worked too much to the point I didn't balance. And my husband said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, you need to do this and this and this because you're not balancing. All you do is work. Well, I love my work, but you can love your work too much. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have boundaries of everything. And I think it's something it takes a long time to teach somebody because what happens is we actually learn our habits about not having boundaries as a child. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to change it, but I think it's necessary. Like there's a lot of gray area when it comes to getting into this field. Oh, there's a lot of gray area and you have to be very, very careful. The one area you cannot make mistakes on is dual relationships. Mm. You have to be sure you don't have a dual relationship. And the best way that I've, I've taught my students and myself to handle that is if you're somebody's therapist, you are not their friend. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for them to hear. You are their therapist. And you cannot go and be at a party with them. You cannot mingle. You can go to a wedding, but you cannot participate in the reception. Right. And I'm very clear with people about that because once you start to cross those boundaries is when people get hurt. Absolutely. And then, I mean, it's also hard because obviously you're getting to know this person and their situation and you're becoming empathetic with them over time. But yes. it's, it's easy for that gray area to 
kind of come to the forefront where obviously you want to be supportive, but also you don't want to overstep a boundary of their personal life. Right, because you want to teach them to be proactive in their own life to have good relationships. Mm -hmm. And many times they get so attached to their therapist that they want their therapist to be their main relationship. And you have to really keep it clear that you want them. The best um, way you know that you're a success as a therapist is when they improve and move on. When they improve and move on and can go live their life in a healthy fashion. And then they come back to me 10 years later, <laughs> knock on my door and say, I'd like you to meet my child. Um, but they've lived their life. And I do get, I often get um, cards and letters and phone calls on Mother's Day, on Easter, on oh, Christmas. Wow. And that's okay. Something like that's okay. Hmm. But they need to live their life. So you have to be very, very careful. If you're a good therapist, you teach them to fly. And it's funny you bring that up because I was actually going to ask about this too because I was talking with my personal therapist about this because, uh, you know, I've gotten like advice every now and then from, you know, studying, like starting, I, I just started studying uh, this fall uh, to go into social work. And uh -huh. a thing that I brought up was how, uh, like, there's a debate over if you choose to either stay with a therapist for a long period of time, like it could be five, 10 years, or if right. it's normal to change out therapists. And the thing that I brought up is that this is just me personally, but I do believe to some level you can get over therapeutized to a certain extent after Correct. being in sessions long enough that you kind of right. have to live and be your own person and gain those experiences to come back and have something to talk about. But also with that, like there's certain periods of your life, especially like in your early 20s, where, you know, you may start with a therapist and you're in a certain mentality. And over time, you change that mentality to where that therapist no longer like serves to what you're looking for right, right now. Right, right. We grow differently and mm. our, needs, um, our needs are different. I recommend um, what you call transition periods. Mm -hmm. I recommend that when I meet with someone, I am their therapist for life as long as they need me. But I recommend they have transition periods where they go and see other therapists, where they go and have life coaches, mm -hmm. where they go and have no one. And But I'm always there as a safety valve. So they would never feel like, oh, we don't have anyone. Um, I have on my phone, people that I've had 20 years ago on my phone and they, if they call their name flashes across my screen and I call them by their name when I answer the phone and we have a little chit chat and maybe that's all they need for another 10 years. But I always have that safety net there because I think it's important. I think one of the mistakes we do make is we terminate completely too early. Mm -hmm. and then people take their lives and that's that's unfortunate so i'm not one of those therapists but i do think you evolve i do have a i work with borderline personality disorder also i'm a specialist and oh, wow. i have some people that i've worked with for you know 20 years um, but they've had their transition periods they've had their um many of them when they're doing really well, they're transitioned into life coaching with me instead of the uh, usual psychotherapy. And that's healthy for them to see that they've grown in that way, that they no longer need that intensive therapy. So there's many ways that you can do that. But yes, it's okay to move on. It's, it's healthy. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. And then I mean, I think it's easier to get caught up in the people that you're helping out, but I feel like that people don't look as much to the therapists themselves. Like, do you feel like this profession has shaped your personal growth or perspective on life in general? And like, how do you manage that stress or burnout in such a emotionally demanding field? Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I do think that I was born with a gift. 
Mm. And I'm not a bragger, but I do believe that my mother knew it when I was four years old. I was born with a gift to be a therapist, to do exactly what I'm doing. And it was so strange when I was four, because my mother would find me in the living room with the older relatives and talking about things that a four-year-old shouldn't even talk about. And she took me to a medical doctor because she thought something was wrong with me. And he said, leave her alone. She's going to do something great. I do believe that some of us um, can handle the stressors and it's not a burden. I believe not. I don't believe that all people should be expected to do that. I do think that for me, it's not a burden and I don't get burned out. But the way I don't get burned out is I have a wonderful husband of 55 years who also was a psychotherapist and was a special educator and is a teacher in our academy. And uh, having him as a support, because he understands what I do, helped a lot so I don't get burned out. The other thing is I balance my life. I go to a massage once mm -hmm. a month. I'm in a choir and a church I'm active in. Mm -hmm. I'm very active in my neighborhood. And so I have a life. I'm a race car driver. I'm oh, also a uh, belt in taekwondo. I have a life beyond my work. And I think that's the only way you can do this profession, especially since my main specialty is suicide prevention. Right. Um, the only way is to balance and to have a life. Uh, but my, I could do this job every day of my life, seven days a week, and I'd be totally happy. But I wouldn't be as healthy as I am. I believe we become healthy when we grow in many different areas and we use our creativity. So that's how I do mine. Well, uh, also congratulations on the 55 years of marriage, too, and all the uh, the, uh, the achievements that you've done outside of uh, therapy. I think that's really cool that you've found so many different hobbies and ways to, like, balance the, the craziness of being in the field. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to. And and you have many talents when you when you you become a young person like you and you're uh, going into a profession, you need to think, OK, I, I, I could do this for a career and I would enjoy it. But what else am I going to do with my life and how am I going to balance my life? Um, I'm continually looking for other opportunities and things that are exciting every year. I learn another specialty literally every year I go into a different specialty and study it because it makes me fresh and it makes things new and it doesn't make me get old. And that's, and I love that for you. Uh, do you see the field of social worker therapy evolving in the next 10 years? Like, do you see people like taking on those kind of things more where instead of just zoning in on the therapy itself, it's more of finding balance within their personal life. Like, how do you see the field? Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'll be real honest. I'm not, um, I, I don't encourage most of the students that talk to me to go into the field of social work. Mm -hmm. I always encourage them to go into the field of professional psychology, okay. but the reason, to, oh, and special ed, I encourage everyone to get a minor in special ed if they're going to be a therapist. Mm, okay. Because we cross paths with people with learning disabilities, ADHD, autism, all kinds of things, and it's better to have more background. But um, social work is such a restricted field. It, um, you can be a private therapist with a social work degree, but most people end up getting a degree in social work and they work for public service um, at social services or whatever and they end up being kind of mini police officers um, monitoring child abuse etc it's an easy way to burn out and so we need people in that profession and you mm -hmm. might be one of them but i'll tell you my dream world is the world I have, which was professional psychology, where I do assessments and testing, which you can't do without your PhD mm. um, and in professional psychology. And I have so much more freedom to do 
um, uh, therapy my way by getting my uh, degree like I did. So uh, explore your options as a young person and decide whether or not social work is the field you need or whether you need professional psychology or special education or whatever it is you need. Because I, um, I have three degrees in special education. Wow. And that's why I'm a good therapist. Yeah, I, I didn't even uh, think about the special ed aspect. So I'll definitely look into that actually after this. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, how do you, how can someone advocate for or contribute to better mental health awareness and resources in their community, even if they're not looking to get into the field? Well, I just think any forums or any um, awareness you can do in your church or in the community is always helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm a, um, uh, we have a domestic violence um, uh, task force here in Rapo County. And I'm chairman of that um, and co-chairman, actually, uh, though we haven't had a meeting lately. Um, and many times that's an opportunity to spread awareness about mental illness and about mental health and about special education and all those things. Sometimes you go into a different form to be a part of a group and you have an opportunity to help people understand and be aware of other things. Yeah, that's that I that's really great advice. I mean, honestly, like uh those are all the questions that I had, uh, but I mean, I really appreciate uh you taking the time to uh talk about this with me. I mean, um I'm a huge mental health advocate. It's actually funny that you brought up uh you know, you've dealt with a lot of people with special ed and uh depression as that was actually similar to my journey personally. Uh, I, I've struggled with uh, depression and uh, bipolar uh, with having autism. Right, correct. Uh-huh. And uh, over the years, you know, uh, for a long time, I tried to suppress those emotions and simplify them. And uh, therapy, uh, psychotherapy specifically, was very helpful for me. And because of that, I've become a huge advocate. And that's what's inspired me to go back to school. So uh, I do feel like I, it kind of feels like a, a window of like like a shared like uh, experience, if that makes sense. So I really yeah, appreciate you, you I, being so I want, vulnerable. I want to say something to you. Yeah, you are very bright. You are very very bright. I I've I've done I've done testing for forty years. I've done uh, therapy for you know all these years. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, you are really not just in highly intelligent. But you have something about you that makes you very special. You have uh, uh, people would listen to you, people would learn from you, people would want to get better, people would want to find out how to make their lives better because you are easy to talk to. I think it's the right decision for you to go into this field, and whether it's social work or whether it's professional psychology or whether it's special ed, or whether it's all <laughs> of those, um, get as much education as you can. But you need to be a spokesperson for mental health. You do. I just, I, I feel it in you, and I haven't even seen you. I have not met you in person, but I can feel it in you. And so please pursue and uh, I wish you the best of luck. If you ever need anything, you have my phone number. You can look me up online um, at America's Academy of Coaching, Counseling, and Hypnotherapy, or you can go to Psychology Today, and you'll find my background with um, um, Greenwood Village, Colorado. But the point I'm trying to make is don't let someone talk you out of this career because you should be in it. And I really appreciate everything that you're saying. It, it's getting me a little choked up, honestly. I mean, uh, I'm not the greatest at articulating my emotions, but know that your words mean more to me in this moment than I can begin to express. And know that, like, it, like I know that there's a lot of challenges ahead with studying and figuring things out, but 
I know that this is the field that I want to be in. I mean, uh, I do feel like that going back to school and uh, getting on top of this degree uh, and getting into the field has actually brought a lot of purpose into my life. Like, uh, you brought up, like, the depression aspect. And, you know, there was a long time in my life that I just didn't know if I would, you know, make it to the next year. But yes, this is, absolutely. but being back in this field, uh, it's given me, like, a timeline almost. Like, I see the future now, if that makes That's sense. Wonderful. Yeah, I, it does. And I want to tell you, I don't tell everyone that. You're the fourth student I spoke to. <laughs> oh, man. First person, you're the first person that I said that to. And I really appreciate that. Like that, that really does mean a lot. And know that I will definitely uh, keep in touch. I'll look uh, into your website. Do you have like an email or anything by chance too? Yeah, my email is D as in dog, R as in rabbit, and then my name, C A R O L A N N W A T S O N at gmail.com and feel free to email me at any time and um and then i could email you my um my websites uh, sherry might have them mm -hmm. um um but i'm not sure if she does but one of the websites is um watson learning and wellness center dot net and then one of them is Oh, I don't know. America's Academy something dot org. Um, but um, I'm sorry. I don't no, I'm in my you're all good. But, but I can always um, I can always email them to you if Sherry doesn't know them. Yeah, perfect. I got your uh, initial email down. So I'll definitely send you a message just thanking you again. And I'll also send a presentation too uh, if you want to check it out. But if not, it's totally cool. What's uh, that? What's that? A, a presentation? Yeah. So. Uh, I'm interviewing you both for an interview assignment, and then I'm putting that into a presentation where I basically just talk about the stuff that I've learned over the last semester in the class. And then there is uh, actually a certain like creative piece that I have to present to with that. And uh, for me, I mean, uh, you know, I like I I'll, I'll be a little vulnerable for a second. Like I've had suicide attempts and stuff like that. Right. And uh, so what I did was I went to the bridge uh, that I tried to attempt my life on and basically uh -huh. just talk about my uh, mental health experience and uh, like, uh, talk like. about how I've turned my like life around in that moment. Oh, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. And, um, and, and, and I just think you sound like an incredible human being. I'm just really happy that Sherry is able to touch your life in some way. Um, uh, Saturday, we have the suicide loss. It's an international thing, and it's across the whole country. Um, it's Friday, Saturday, and mm -hmm. Sunday, but in Denver, it's sun, uh, Saturday. And it's for anyone who's who's been a survivor of suicide, uh, meaning, uh, you know, they've um, uh, either attempted or they have lost a family member or friend, mm -hmm. and it's a profound experience. So as you're in school, you can learn about these different associations and different activities that you may or may not want to participate in, because you have to be very careful that you don't, uh, you have to balance things. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just explore suicide prevention. That's only one piece of mental illness. Exactly. A hundred percent. Like it's more of like, um, it's kind of like the small window that gets into the world of the craziness, if that makes sense. Right, right. And we do have kind of a crazy world right now. And what we have to remember is that we can be the calmness and we can be the power and I use the word power, not lightly. We can be the power to affect change in this world. We don't have to think that all the changes are way beyond us. The changes are within us and within our communities and our daily living. If each of us affects change, and if we can just teach people how to do that, then we don't have to be burdened by the changes that happen from up above. Yeah, I mean, you you hit it right on the nail. I mean, 
you're 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 really good at um articulating yourself and like uh, putting in like almost a poetic light into it so i really appreciate that well i no one's ever said that before but thank you you're very sweet good luck to you and i know you have lots to do as i do too i have to get ready for another client 